While surfing YouTube, I stumbled upon this video titled Christian Tells Buddhist the Problem with Buddhism. That piqued my interest, so I watched it. It was not a very good or interesting piece of apologetics slash propaganda. Still, I consider it worthwhile to use it for two purposes. To clarify possible misunderstandings one might have while watching this, and secondly, to point out a problem. Let's watch it together. When it comes to the abortion issue, are you pro-life or pro-death? I'm actually pro-life. Do you believe in God's existence? Yes, I do. My faith in the Buddhist religion has sort of shaped my views on how the world works. Is Buddhism atheistic in nature? In a way, it isn't. In a way, it isn't? Yes. Do you believe in a supreme creator? Yes, I do. Is this a... A lot to unpack here. Firstly, abortion. While not considered a noble pursuit, the Buddha doesn't care enough to strip you off your personal opinion on the matter. Life and coming to be alive is viewed as a continuity of samsaric states, not a grand one-time event for a soul having just one chance to prove its worth. Sorry, universalists, I'm generalizing here. Buddhism can be atheistic, can be polytheistic, can be monotheistic, though that's less likely. But that is not a matter of great relevance or concern. The reason is simple. The Dhamma does not offer salvation via external entities. Knowledge is both the moral and salvific, if you wish, foundation for breaking free from the cycle of death and rebirth. Practice is how that foundation is cemented to bring about the insight into the reality as it is. The opening of the Dhamma I, in terms of the Pali Canon. While some sects might suggest rebirth, reappearance in an intermediary realm, for example the pure abodes, wherein one is instructed by a higher being to get the final realization and attain Nibbana, even this path presupposes personal effort and insight, with the helper not being the goal. And canonically, the human state would be seen as the most conducive to that realization anyway, at least setting out on the correct path, entering the stream. Moving on to the idea of the Supreme Creator. To put it simply, that's irrelevant for arriving at the final destination of a Buddhist's spiritual journey. That creator, however powerful or majestic, is bound, similarly to any other being, to the cycle of death and rebirth, to the unbending, impersonal principles of karma. Is the Supreme Creator happy with you as a person? I think he is. So you're not doing anything morally wrong that he could frown upon? Do you think you're a good person? Yes. How many lies have you told in your life? I would say I've to told some lies, but I've been a morally honest, upstanding person. So what do you call someone who tells lies? Immoral, dishonest. <laughs> now, have you ever stolen something in your whole life, even if it's small? No. Have you ever used God's name in vain? Nope. OMG? Nope. Here, the interviewee is presenting himself as a decent person. He tries to not commit bad actions. In Christianity, those might be construed as sin. For Buddhists, lying, stealing, swearing excessively are actions leading to states conducive to suffering. On the contrary, positive actions, such as abstention from stealing, honest and moderate speech, are viewed as conducive to reaching a state free of suffering, knowledge and action. Using God's name in vain seems like a weird question to ask a Buddhist, but I shall take the interviewee's answer as him refraining from unnecessary, useless talk. Right speech. Now, Jesus said if you look at a woman and lust for her, you commit adultery with her in your heart. Have you ever looked at a woman with lust? No. Are you homosexual? Uh, no, I'm not. Well, I suppose that there have been a few times in my life where whenever I do encounter a, a young, beautiful young beautiful woman with very very good looking feminine features I'd say that I do so that doesn't happen very often in this college there's not very many desirable women is that what you're telling me there are desirable women on this campus it's just that I do my best to try to suppress my inner desires you so know, you're, you're, to give off that uh, sex, sexual predator vibe so that's what Buddhism is it's, yeah. it's not much to say sexual misconduct 
is neither part of right action nor right livelihood for a Buddhist. As he is not a monk, I presume, he need not be bound by celibacy, but refraining from wanton lust is commendable. So that's what Buddhism is. It's yeah. instilling the desire within your heart. Yeah. It's a beast. You can't do it. It's a monster. Yeah. It's always going to be there. Exactly. Have you ever looked at pornography? From time to time. Okay. No, it's not what Buddhism is. Buddhism is about freeing yourself from states leading to suffering and breaking free from the shackles of samsara by means of internalizing and acting upon knowledge and insight. If I were to try and put it into one sentence. Simply stealing one's desires does not cut it. Even for a monk practicing in an isolated forest abode, it's explicitly stated by the Buddha that a. Not feeling agitated by something by simply being removed from it spatially is not having achieved freedom from it. And b. Negative states are to be actively removed by striving to reach positive states. Non-hatred, loving kindness instead of hatred and anger. And so on. That's lust, and that's not suppressing that desire. And yeah, so, I mean, during my spare time, but not, during, not in public. I'm not judging you, Samuel. You've told me that you're a liar and an adulterer at heart. So if God judges you by the Ten Commandments, we'll look at four of them, on Judgment Day you're going to be innocent or guilty? I would say guilty. Heaven or hell? Perhaps hell. Now, does that concern you? I would say just a bit. So now you're accusing him of being a liar and an adulterer. An adulterer based on a cherry-picked quote of your religion's founder. Then you go on to impose your conceptions of heaven and hell on the guy and ask a question based on what that means to you. A very primitive way to tackle it, betraying your extremely lazy approach to missionary work, if that was it. So, heaven and hell, how are those relevant to Buddhism? Canonically, Buddhism follows the ideas of its birthplace, India, in partitioning the world into separate realms of existence. Planes, if you will. Some inhabited by benevolent gods, some by less pleasant divinities. Some by hungry and restless spirits. Some by entities whose existence is nearly constant suffering. Thus, you could vaguely call some of them heavens, some of them hells. Some Buddhists have adopted the mythological conception of special entities specifically punishing those falling into the hellish realms for their misdeeds. Regardless, what is interesting here is that, in Buddhism, no samsaric state is permanent. If you read the Pali Canon, you would notice the mention of some good but not fully enlightened persons being reborn in godly realms upon dissolution of the mortal flesh. Moreover, even the Buddha, when recalling his past lives, mentions an array of entities that were him at some point in time. Even Mara, the great deceiver, is not a stable figure and bound by the karmic principles. Nor is he the soul Mara. All the things mentioned as states, destinations, roles, within the samsaric cycle of death and rebirth, driven by karma. With the Buddha being sort of an insider figure who broke free from it and is helping the others do so as well. It's not that the same person corresponds to each. Not even closely. Bit. Well, big bit. This is, your, this is your life. There's nothing more important, Samuel. Do you know what God did for guilty sinners so we wouldn't have to go to hell? Do you know the gospel? Uh, no. Well, God became a human being, a perfect sinless man. That's who Jesus was. The Bible says God was manifest in the flesh. He was the express image of the invisible God. And the reason God became a perfect sinless person was to offer his life on the cross for the sin of the world. In other words, you and I broke God's law, the Ten Commandments. Jesus paid the fine. That's what happened on the cross. And just before he died, he called out, it is finished, which is a weird thing to say when you're dying, the last words. But he was saying the debt has been paid. If you're in court and someone pays you a fine, even though you're guilty, the judge can let you go and do that which is right and just and legal. You can say, Samuel, you've got a stack of speed and fines here. They're very serious, but someone's paid the fines. You're free to go. And he does that which is legal. Well, God can legally dismiss your case, guilty though you are, because Jesus paid the fine. That means he can commute your death sentence. He can take death off you, which is capital punishment, and grant you everlasting life as a free gift, all because of the death and resurrection of the Savior. What you have to do, Samuel... A barrage of stock preaching unleashed upon the interviewee. If he really does not know your gospel, do you really think that a macabre description of a self-sacrifice on a cross can make it any more appealing to him? 
That sounds absolutely bizarre and alien to anybody not privy to your region's tenets. Buddhism does not permit the possibility that a sacrificial offering to any kind of entity will relieve you of the burden of your misdeeds. Seeing their cause, their nature, how they affect you and those around you, and seeing the way to eventually break free from the chain of cause and effect is the only way. Unless you have reached the fully enlightened state, your past karma will follow you, whether positive or negative, and you will suffer the resultant state, pleasurable or detrimental in this life or the next. Even a fully enlightened person bound to break free from samsara upon their death will not be free from the earthly consequences as exemplified in this excerpt of Angulimala Sutta. There is no praying away the sin in Buddhism. You have to do, Samuel, is not suppress your sinful desires, but repent of them, turn from them, and trust in Jesus like you trust a parachute. So you've got a big problem. You've got to face the moral law on Judgment Day, the justice of God. And it's like being on a plane and having to face the law of gravity. Stephen Hawking said, gravity is a law. And if you're going to jump without a parachute, you're going to hit the ground at 120 miles an hour on your face. So that's fearful. But if someone gives you a parachute, then you're going to hit the ground at 8 miles an hour on your feet. You are now saved from gravity. And when you trust in Jesus, you're saved from God's law, the consequences of breaking the law, because of what Jesus did on the cross. If you repent and trust in Jesus, God will remit your sins, forgive you, and grant you everlasting life. He'll release you from that guilty conscience. He'll forgive all those unclean sexual desires and those imaginations that he's seen. All those deeds done in darkness, they can be washed away in an instant because God's rich in mercy. Is that clear, or do you want me to run through it again? Uh, yes, I completely understand. The law allegory has somewhat made sense, as I attempted to show above when discussing karma. But the karmic law is even more fundamental than gravity in Buddhism, because it is one of the defining principles of the universe, which survives its cycles of collapse and expansion. A Buddhist view on the matter. Still, there is no praying away the sin in Buddhism. Whatever your deeds with negative karmic consequences, you have your deeds with positive karmic consequences, and unless you have reached the final Nibbana, you will continue to be the result of their interplay until you have. I completely understand your explanation. Okay. So you're going to think about this? Uh, yes, I will. You mean seriously think about it? Yes. I appreciate that, because you don't know when you're going to die. It could be tonight, it could be tomorrow, it could be next week, so this is your eternity. Yes. So I'll just leave you the words of Jesus. He said, what shall a prophet a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? This saying of Jesus makes sense in Buddhism. To the extent that earthly possessions are fleeting and impermanent, take over your mind by proliferating desires of preserving them, desires of accumulating more, and torment you with the fear of losing them, if not actual loss. Other than that, missing the point. To sum up, I use that as an opportunity to elucidate some Buddhist fundamentals to you. I have no interest to touch upon problems of Christianity in this video, but I should like to point out that starting a discussion with the sole purpose of dumping your beliefs on another that done in the most patronizing and perfunctory fashion, without apparently taking any real interest in the basics of what it is you're finding problematic, is nothing but unproductive, a show of your hubris and a sheltered mind. Words do matter. What a perfect example the raw that was.